It's now my great pleasure to introduce resident expert and deranged millionaire, John Hodgman. <laughs> John is at the center of some really great debates of our time. Mac or PC? Is a hot dog a sandwich? For the record, although he played PC in Apple commercials, he is a Mac guy, and he feels a hot dog is definitely not a sandwich. He tackles questions like these in his popular podcast, Judge John Hodgman, and his weekly New York Times Magazine column. While his website calls his career in front of the camera, which began on The Daily Show, frankly implausible, his dry wit has come to be beloved by the masses. His new book, Vacation Land, True Stories from Painful Beaches, is a collection of his real-life New England coastal wanderings, the horrors he's found there, and the awful truths he's encountered as a human being facing his 40s. <laughs> Best-selling author Sarah Vale hailed, this here yawn has everything you want. Laughs, love, death, the obligatory legume-shaped vessel, Hodgman's wide-eyed sense of place is as irresistible as his playful yet unflinching sense of self. His talk tonight will be in conversation with his good friend, Mary Richardson Graham. We're so pleased to have him here with us. Ladies, gentlemen, and variations thereupon, please join me in welcoming John Hodgman and Mary Richardson Graham to the Free Library Forum. Thank you. Thank you so much to Donkey Dover Jr. A gentleman I just met, I could n not be happier to know someone named Donkey Dover Jr. So many, <laughs> so many stories there that are yet to be teased out. Uh, he, he lives a life of adventure. He was just telling me about how he bicycled from here to Bar Harbor, Maine to go to a wedding, uh, an insane endeavor. And all the time he was doing that, his name, <laughs> Donkey Dover the uh, Second. It's so nice to be here in his presence and yours. I'm going to bring Mary out in a little bit, but I couldn't resist the opportunity to stand here behind this beautiful carved podium uh, that I've stood behind before, uh, the Free Library of Philadelphia is a very special place to me, is a place where I did some of my very first uh, literary uh, events back uh, after I had left uh, publishing and had begun writing stuff on my own. Uh, and um, this, uh, this uh, podium was there, lectern, I suppose it is, uh, then, as I believe it has always been here, going back to the time of ancient druids. Uh, <laughs> And uh, we're going to talk about m my new book. It's very, un I feel very uncomfortable because during the time that I spent uh, uh, attending and being part of the 215 Literary Festival uh, that was such a great part of Philadelphia's uh, civic life for a number of years and which Mary had founded, um, uh, I was often the interlocutor rather than the interlocuted. So, and I don't like I don't, I don't like being interviewed as though I'm interesting. I prefer to talk to other people. Um, so when Mary comes out here, we're just going to have a nice conversation about the olden days. Uh, and uh, this book that I wrote, which is called Vacation Land. Uh, Vacation Land, as you may know, is the nickname for the state of Maine. Uh, I can only imagine that it was so nicknamed as a cruel joke because people, if you've been to Maine, and I know at least one person in this room... <laughs> has been there, and I don't need to tell you his name. <laughs> if you go to Maine looking for a vacation, you will discover that it is a hard place that does not care if you live or die with oceans that are made of hate that want to kill you, with coldness and beaches that offer no refuge because they are made of rocks and jagged knives. And it is not a place where you go... <laughs> It is not a place where you go to enjoy yourself, but to test yourself with uh, literal pain and existential dread. Uh, and a place where my wife and I spend a great deal of time 
uh, now uh, in the past couple of years since um, we purchased a home there. The second half of the book is about largely uh, my uncomfortable wanderings through that wilderness. The first half of the book is about my wanderings through a different wilderness, the, the wilderness of rural western Massachusetts, where I spent a lot of my youth, although I'm not from there. I'm from, I am from the citified east of Massachusetts, in Brookline, Massachusetts. Uh, sure, that's right. <laughs> That's, that's a, a, a one polite golf clap for an affluent suburb of Boston is entirely appropriate. Uh, see you at the country club. But uh, rural Western Massachusetts is not the country club. It is. It's you know what the, the misunderstanding and of a lot of the a lot of the uh, the media is that uh, our our world here, and certainly in New England and here in Pennsylvania in the relative Northeast, is that it is a, a bastion of progressive uh, elite coastal uh, jerks, uh, but there is real country around, and you know it. <laughs> uh, and, and rural Western Massachusetts is the country that I uh, did not belong to and, and wandered through a lot in my youth and, and great terror. Um, I, I thought I would uh, open uh, this with a reading from the book, uh, which is not something I've done in a long time, is actual reading from a thing. Um, but this is a piece that comes in the middle of the book between uh, the Massachusetts section and the uh, main section. And I, I'm going to uh, read it to you here. I just it, it opened naturally to that section. That's amazing. It's faded. <laughs> I wanted to read this section to you because um, it's not about Massachusetts or Maine. Um, instead, it, it marks the turn from uh, childhood to adulthood uh, in the book. And um, it's a ghost story. And it ha it's Halloween time. So I thought I would open with a spooky ghost story. And then Mary will come out. And then we'll talk for a while. And then we will all talk for a while. And then I'll go out and sign some things for you if you wish. And um, then it'll be over, as all things, <laughs> as all things eventually are. Uh, as I as I always say, uh, all's well that ends. <laughs> so the name of this of this piece is called Graveyard Fun. When my daughter was younger, we would sometimes go to the cemetery. The cemetery is called Greenwood Cemetery, and it's in Brooklyn where we live, and its main entrance is on 24th Street, where a giant Gothic triple-spired gate presides. And a colony of green monk parakeets lives there, supposedly descendants of a long-ago pet store jailbreak. And they nest and chatter among the spires in its cold, stony hollows. They liven things up, because parakeets are known for their irony. But there is a side gate nearer to where we live that my daughter and I stumbled across one spring. It was just there at the end of Prospect Park West, hiding in plain sight after the last block of shops like a purloined letter. I was excited when we found it. I already loved our neighborhood, but to discover after years of living there that it also had a secret door to a massive Edward Gorey-esque necropolis was a dream-like gift, an embarrassment of weird riches. I said to my daughter, never forget what I have given you. <laughs> Let's go inside this cemetery. I didn't have this terrible beard at that time. I only had a mustache, and it was a rainy day, and it was humid and gray, springtime, and I was wearing a raincoat, and I had my hood up, and for some reason I had dark sunglasses on, and my daughter was wearing her red rain jacket and yellow boots. And together like this, we approached the guard in his little booth by the gate, and he stopped us and he said, are you sure you want to go into the cemetery? And I said, I am absolutely sure I want to go into the cemetery. And he said, I am not talking to you, sir. <laughs> I'm talking to her. <laughs> and then he looked at my daughter and he said, the cemetery is very large. There are many places you can go where no one could hear you if you needed help. <laughs> Even if there were a lot of visitors today, which there are not because it's raining out, uh, they would not be able to hear you if you needed help. So I ask again, 
Are you sure you want to go into this cemetery alone with this man who has a mustache <laughs> and is wearing dark sunglasses? And my daughter said, I am not afraid. That is my father. <laughs> Reluctantly, the guard accepted this truth and let us pass. And the guard was right. The cemetery was mostly empty, at least above ground. Below ground, it was full to bursting. It's a very old cemetery. They don't bury many bodies there anymore. They're almost out of room. So the ground was heaving with the dead, and nature feasted on it. We wandered over mounds of the greenest grass, and the limbs of the dogwoods, heavy with rain and fresh blooms, dipped to meet us as we navigated around the headstones and the obelisks and peered through gated windows into dark tombs. It was vivid and beautiful and frankly awesome and not at all scary. And in fact, it wasn't scary. The only thing that was scary in the cemetery was me and my daughter. We were the scariest thing there. There were mourners actually there. It wasn't entirely empty. And because it's such a large cemetery, they had roads that would uh, traverse the various lanes of the dead. And you can drive your car right in there to go find the person you want to lay a flower for or whatever it is. And the cars would pass along the road. And every time the cars passed us, our, my daughter and I would wave to them. And we would stand side by side and go like this. And every time this happened, the car would stop <laughs> and pause. And you could almost hear the internal monologue of the driver weighing two decisions. Do I get out of the car and save that child <laughs> from that obvious horrible human trafficker? Or do I stay in the car and save myself from those two obvious creepy ghosts? <laughs> who are smiling and waving at me, trying to lure me out of the car and trap me and bring me down below ground. This internal debate would go on for a while, and then eventually the car would move on. And this happened several times. And I turned to my daughter and said, this is amazing. <laughs> we should come back here every Saturday. <laughs> We'll stand here by the side of the road and just wait for the cars to come and we'll wave at them and scare them. And then when they turn the corner, we'll run over the hill to get them as they come around the other end and do it again. Like the haunted hitchhiker in the twilight zone. Look at us, I said to my daughter. We have all the specific odd details that make a good ghost story. People will say, I went to the cemetery. I saw them, the pale girl in the red raincoat and the mustache man who killed her. <laughs> they will tell their story to their friends, and soon enough, people will come looking for us. And they may even imagine they have seen us, even on those days when we do not come. And even when you've grown older and you're in college, and I am too sad to come here by myself on my own, our journey through this underworld will still be talked about and may be seen, and we will become legends. We will continue like descendants of descendants of the birds. And that way, I told my daughter, we will live forever. Thank you, you guys. So that's, that's that. Mary Richardson Graham uh, is, a, is an old friend. Oh, there she is. Oh, wait, wait, I'm giving you the big, hold on. Okay. So Mary Richardson Graham is one of my favorite people, a wonderful person, obviously not a show person, because she came out before she was even introduced. <laughs> so you guys are going to have to compensate for her completely understandable error uh, of revealing herself before her introduction, so that when she does come out, you're going to have to really applaud hard and cheer hard. And you'll do this not only because I've told you to, but also because it's correct to do it. She deserves your loud applause and cheers. Uh, more than a decade ago, more than 15 years ago, I dare say, almost that. I hate to think in these terms, but life is 
flying from me as we speak, and it goes fast. I came here at her uh, invitation to be part of the first uh, McSweeney's Festival outside of New York, which then morphed into its own festival, which is called the 215 Festival. It went on for a number of years. I got to sit on this stage uh, or stand on this stage, perform, read, introduce uh, heroes of mine like Amy Sedaris and David Byrne uh, and Jonathan Lethem and many, many other incredible authors and creators that I would not have met were it not for the great 215 Festival. If it were not for the 215 Festival, Mary Richardson Graham would not have taken me either to Bob and Barbara's for the first time or for that matter to Little Pete's. I owe her so much and so much more again. Uh, she and her husband Patrick own the great Brickbat Books, uh, which is a great bookstore with a difficult name to say. Brickbat Books, right? Did I get it right? Yes, I got it right. Uh, which is an amazing bookstore here in Philadelphia that you should uh, uh, peruse, uh, as well as uh, I don't I don't wish to overlook the wonderful Joseph Fox Bookstore, who is selling books here tonight that you were forced to buy in order to be in this room. Uh, thanks to all bookstores, is what I say. Uh, and thanks especially to Mary Richardson Graham for agreeing to be here tonight to chat with me on stage again. Ladies and gentlemen, and here's where you come in, Mary Richardson Graham. Uh, thanks for loaning me your copy of the book to read that. Well, happy, happy to do it. I was intimidated by the number of post-its in it. I was and notes. I saw good. one that said Grey Gardens, and I cannot wait to talk about that. Oh, you want to jump, jump right in there? I don't know. You, you, you lead the way. We'll just put a pin in Grey Gardens. I want, definitely want to get to it. Okay. Um, Hi, Mary. Well, you're talking about how long we've known each other. Yes. Which Did I rob all of your opening material? No, no, no. All right. no, no. Um, but I, that, when I was backstage, I was looking at one of the things I had uh, prepared for tonight, which was... One of the first events we ever did together yes. with Darren Strauss, yes. Hannah Tinty, yes. Whitney Pastrick. Yes, at the um, Rosenbach Museum. At the Rosenbach Museum, which is a wonderful place. Um, the event was called Up All Night, Hot Young Writers. Hot. <laughs> <laughs> two, there, two of those words do not belong. <laughs> <laughs> we were definitely writers. <laughs> Say that. Dear Hot young writers discuss their their childhood spin fears. tales of fear, <laughs> and it was a Halloween -y event there at the Rosenbach. Yeah, I remember. And do you know? I just saw Darren Strauss, who's a, no a great novelist and memoirist, uh, and had been my client at Writer's House when I was very briefly a literary agent. I saw him two nights ago, and uh, we were not discussing this or anything. He just said, "Do you ever? Do you remember going to the Rosenbach Museum and doing that?" that hot young writers thing and I say I think about it all the time because I, rem I, I believed at the time that I was hot and young <laughs> but no I, I you know he, he and I and I've not seen Darren literally for a, almost a full year we've never discussed it since then but clearly he remembers that event I remember that event and uh, that was, was so special about what you put together here uh, so thank you but what was your question sorry <laughs> And it was just to point out that we were hot and young. At, yeah, that's at, right. At one point. Well, it's true. But now we're not. <laughs> no, we're, we're still hot, but we're not young, that's for sure. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, that was, a good, that was a good time. There was a, something I was going to say about that, but I can't. Do you remember what year that was? I believe it was 2003. 2003. Were yeah. we ever, did that ever happen? Um, I remember it pretty distinctly because I had a four-year-old then. Right. Who you meant. That's right. And, and you like to have graveyard fun with your children, too, because you took us all and your four-year-old daughter to the Mutter Museum mm -hmm. to go look at megacolons and piles of skulls. <laughs> and, I, and I had a one-year-old child at that time, and I was like, I really need to up my game. I need to, <laughs> I need to trust the four-year-olds. I'm about... I'm a, I'm about to vomit and then run home screaming because this terrifies me so much. But here is this four-year-old <laughs> child looking at all of these trepanned skulls, just be like, mm-hmm, I understand. I understand that we're all meat and bone when it comes to the end. She said that. And so I was like, kids can handle a lot more than I realize. So thank you for that lesson. And now she must be 
she must be like 10 or 11 by now. Little, little, She's really growing up. A little bit older than that, oh. little 19. Yeah, I don't like that at all. <laughs> How are you? I'm very I don't mean to, you, you, have, a, you have an agenda? I, well, you know, I read your book, which, I, which I really liked. Thank it's you. really good. That's nice of you to say and thank you. I wrote it that way on purpose. <laughs> You know, um, I think the first time I heard some of it was about three years ago. Yeah, uh, at, at, at uh, what's it called? The under, underground, the underground un arts, arts. Underground arts mm -hmm. in 2014 mm -hmm. was actually where I first told some of the stories that ended up being in this book. And mm -hmm. I was going to do the other show that I was performing at that time. But I was like, I like these stories about Maine and Massachusetts and stuff, and I'm going to tell them here. And I made a split-second decision to do it, and it worked out okay. And if it hadn't, maybe we wouldn't be here now talking about this book. I, I, Just saying, it's, it's as much, this book is as much about Philadelphia as it's about <laughs> anything else. If you, if you haven't read it, the whole Massachusetts to Maine thing, it's, it's really about Philadelphia. Yeah, it's all, really, it's all a metaphor for Philadelphia. <laughs> <laughs> but, and you have spent some time here because you have family here. I have family literally here right now. I'm looking at them. Yeah, that's right. The whole, the whole one, two, three, fourth row is mm -hmm. uh, composed of uh, my mom's younger sisters and their families. Uh, my mom grew up in uh, Northeast Philadelphia in Mayfair, and they did as well. And now they're elsewhere in, in the region. And, uh, and uh, well, technically, they're right there. Um, and, uh, <laughs> And uh, we need to not draw any more attention to them because they would prefer to be the show. <laughs> Philadelphians. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and my Uncle Jim. I didn't see you there, Jim. So also my mom's younger brother is here too. So it's, <laughs> it's really, really everybody. <laughs> uh, congratulations on your engagement, guys. <laughs> my cousin Aaron just got engaged. And another Jim. So... Luckily, they don't serve alcohol here, or they would be screaming right now. So, uh, yes, I love Philadelphia, and I have a deep, a deep uh, feeling of connection to it. And that's why everyone here... Oh, you've already bought the book. Oh, I don't care what you think, then. No, no. So, in spite of loving Philadelphia, you ended up with a vacation home in Maine. Well, that was not my choice. I, my I could tell, because in the book, it seems like you really fear Maine. You think there's murder around every corner. Who here has been to me? <laughs> I have not. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> so that's true about me. <laughs> you know, Maine is called vacation land, as I mentioned before, and the I did not choose to go there. My my wife uh, has family there, although even though her grandmother lived there for thirty years year round, and both of her uncles live there year round now and her father goes there for most of every year and together they probably have about 75 years worth of collective clinging to the shores of Maine. They would never ever be considered to be from Maine. Um, they will always be from away because they are not two generations deep in Maine. Maine does not accept you easily. Uh, it wants to shrug you off as quickly as possible. <laughs> off of its shores into the, into the water. And though it lives on tourism, it has a very uh, complicated relationship with the people who come from Massachusetts and elsewhere to uh, demand lobster rolls and directions and, <laughs> <laughs> and other things from them. Um, so it, it is both geographically, as I described earlier, an unfriendly place and culturally a rather misanthropic place. Uh, and yet, uh, people still go there. Uh, all the time, <laughs> even though science has done research to show that there are beaches that are nice to walk on, <laughs> and there are bodies of water that are warm and make you feel like maybe you deserve pleasure. <laughs> there are other places to go, but people still go to Maine, and my wife especially loves Maine more than any other place or, frankly, person on Earth. And over the the, the 25 or more years that we've known each other in various states of uh, engagement and marriage, she has dragged me up there. And, um, and then we, we always, I, the writing was on the wall that we would eventually purchase a home there. And uh, I thought that that would happen 
uh, when we were much closer to death, <laughs> but it accidentally happened a couple of years ago, which means it was a much premature purchase, or else I don't know what's coming next <laughs> and soon. But I've grown to appreciate it. You know, Maine is a place that, um, uh, that of real rugged beauty and danger at every step. Um, and you know, it, uh, it, 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 the beauty of Maine uh, is so overwhelming, and the danger of falling off of things or falling onto sharp things <laughs> is so great that it reminds you that nature doesn't care if you live or die, and that is a different kind of vacation. <laughs> <laughs> and since I realized, oh, I never really believed that I deserved happiness in the first place. This is really where I where I should be, and I would prefer to be in a, in a place where I am tested, rather <laughs> existentially tested, rather than, than, uh, than rewarded, um, because if I were in a nice place, I would just feel uncomfortable, but going into the water in Maine and having every cell in my body scream the first half of the word hypothermia, and then stop, because my, all of the cells in my body have frozen solid, uh, and then getting used to it and coming out of it alive, mm -hmm. that's my idea of a good time. And the hypothermia might extend your life. Well, no, hypothermia <laughs> is very dangerous. And <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if there's any, anybody here who might, is now thinking about going to Maine, but don't, I mean, you can go swimming, but don't go in for a long time. That's part of the reason why I like it so much, is that... Uh, you, you can, it's, the water is very cold, you do get used to it, you start to feel like, oh, this is very pleasant, and that's when you start to black out and drown. <laughs> so, I like that there is a built-in safety limit to the amount of time I can move my body around, because I prefer not to if I, so, you know, going into the water in Maine, you, you move around for a little while, you come out of it, you feel like you've survived something, and it's great that now it's a good time to go home for a nap or a glass of wine or something. And that's what, that's what the vacation, I think, people from Boston and New York were looking for when they first started invading Maine. They wanted to go, they wanted to, go to a cold, dark place and clutch a martini and never talk to their family and, and stare out balefully over dark bodies of water that you would never go into. <laughs> That was the definition of vacation in the, you know, into the middle into the middle of the last century when people suddenly had cars and a middle class lifestyle and could go places. Mm -hmm. Because the vacation was invented. I'm sorry, Mary, but I have to say this: <laughs> vacation didn't exist in, until after, World War, like, as a concept in American mm -hmm. culture, like people, um, only the most wealthy and warped and inbred blue bloods were able to <laughs> go to some other place for long periods of time because the air was better for their gout or whatever. <laughs> Most people could never go on vacation because if, the, if you lived in the country, you had a farm to tend to, you could not just go away. And if you lived in the city, you, had, you, had, you were busy dying in a shirtwaist factory fire or something. That was your job. You know, the idea of vacation didn't really exist until after, you know, the, in, until the baby boom. And, and people had cars and could go places. And guess where they did not go? unless you lived in Massachusetts and didn't know better. <laughs> they, they did not go to Maine, they went to Florida. Right. Right, yeah. which has its own, its own creepy history, but we'll talk about that another time. So uh, I was going to ask you, yes. if you hadn't had Massachusetts and Maine thrust upon you, where you would have chosen to vacation. But then you said that you don't think you deserve happiness, so maybe you would have never made that choice. And maybe it would be like my vacationless husband. <laughs> does Patrick not go on vacation? He really does not like to leave his bookstore. Yeah, you like to you because you like to work. It's like a perpetual, you know, vacation. Yeah, working in a bookstore is like a perpetual vacation. <laughs> I, you know what? I know what you're talking about. The worst, the the thing that I I feel saddest about. I mean, technology has enhanced so much of our lives, and if it were not for the internet, mm -hmm. uh, I would not have been able to apply a trade as a writer and meet you and mm -hmm. find uh, Dave Eggers early on who really encouraged me to, to be a creative person and, it was, and then professionally to, to write for magazines. But I do really regret that, um, 
the internet took out uh, video stores because that's the greatest fucking job in the world. <laughs> I worked in a video store. I would have done it for the rest of my life. <laughs> just the laziest job in the world. <laughs> you just stand there and watch movies and make chit-chat with people. And the best thing about chit-chatting with people in the video store is um, you, it's, it's not just talking to your neighbor. It's talking to your neighbor that you have a file on. You have all their information. <laughs> At your disposal, you have you have do, you have a, a dossier of all of the things they all of their taste, all the things they've rented. It's an amazing. It, it was an amazing, great job. I would never have gone on vacation from that one either. And the fact is, I don't really go on vacation either because, for whatever it is that I do as a marginally self-employed person, as a writer and performer, or whatever it is that I'm doing, I have a lot of different jobs. But I can sort of arrange when those jobs need me to be in one place or the other. Mm -hmm. But I work all throughout the summer when we go up. To, my, my wife teaches high school, and, uh, and I, my, my kids are unemployable. So <laughs> we, we have a whole chunk of the year that we can go relocate to, to originally to Western Massachusetts and now to Maine. Um, and uh, and I'm, I don't, there's not a day there that I'm not working a little, a mm -hmm. little bit. I don't really luxuriate, and luckily Maine doesn't allow that anyway, so. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that, I think we're in a place now which is very similar in a way before vacation was introduced as a concept in culture, more and more people are, are self-employed freelance mm -hmm. people or contract workers. They can't either literally afford to take a break, or if they take a break and go someplace else, they're going to be tied to their job no matter what. The idea of literally going away and turning everything off was uh, initially an aristocratic luxury that we can't aspire to. Not even me, and I've been on television. Uh, but, uh, but certainly, the, the, what was, it, it was a middle class, mm -hmm. an, an appropriate middle class luxury to be able to just turn it off and go away for a period of time. It was built into your work schedule um, and a very humane, like so many things that were promised to the middle class that have been taken away, a very humane way of living that, that, that very few people get to enjoy now. Some serious social commentary for you guys. Yeah. yeah. Right there. Should we, should we find something even more depressing to talk about? No. Let's, talk, that? No. <laughs> <laughs> let's, it, let's bring okay. it up for a little bit and then we can bring it down. Right. So um, I like... You, you uh, write a lot about weird dads. You are a weird dad. You grew a beard yeah. because you're a weird dad. I'm well, married to a weird dad. Yeah. I, all dads are weird. <laughs> all dads after 40 are weird. <laughs> you know, I think because, I mean, I grew a beard only because I don't know why. It was a compulsion that I had. I grew a beard for the same reason all weird dads grow facial hair. It's, it's like a, a, a compulsory evolutionary impulse to signal to the world with your face, I'm all done. <laughs> People who are still mating, no thank you. I don't want to presume you're interested in it, but this is really showing you right now. Stay away. I know I have, I, my, I've, I've fulfilled my evolutionary purpose. My children exist. My DNA is out there. I no longer deserve physical affection. It's time for me to focus on new hobbies. <laughs> Like, like puns and research into world wars and bridges. <laughs> yeah, I mean, once dads become dads, that's, that's, their, I mean, that's their job. I mean, tormenting their children. Tormenting their children, but like, you know, you're, you're, this is what I think to some degree m makes middle age so um, uh, uh, challenging uh, to people because you realize on some deep core level that your, your evolutionary job is done. Um, you may have some other job. You still have to pay for college and whatever it is. You have to still work. Do you know what I mean? But, but your life's work, to some degree, if you've had children, it's like that you've done your part. Now it's just you just are training your, your replacements. Uh, <laughs> it's just, it's sad. It's, it's sad. And, you know, then when your kids get to be teenagers, it's like you tra you're trying to train your replacements and they're like, they're already better and smarter than you. Yes. And they're like, by the w goodbye, I'm going to Paris. Yeah. That's like some teenagers that I've heard of anyway. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So, yeah. yeah, I think that 
I think that's when weird dads, and you know, and you know, that's when dads get weird, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, and that's when moms get weird too. You know, my my mom was turning weird. She passed away in two thousand, but mm-hmm. but she she was kind of was obsessed with various weird hobbies and and stuff that she was going down some weird rabbit holes trying to find a plot in her life. <laughs> It's just what happens, you know, when, when you're reaching the end of your <laughs> professional life and your, and your you know, your, your, the biological imperative, like, what do you do next? And I think that that is to some, I call the, I bill the book as the white privilege mortality comedy of John Hodgman, because <laughs> I believe in truth in advertising. And those are, those are the preoccupations underlying this, incre- by the way, incredibly funny book. It is, it Very is. hilarious book about uh, decline and death. Uh, <laughs> You'll have a great time. And by the way, kids love it. <laughs> 13-year-olds, 14-year-olds come to my, my show. That, that This was originally devised as an as a imitation stand-up show. I built it into a book. It's, it's, and kids would come to that thing, and they'd be like, I really understand my dad better now. <laughs> so, you know, dads and grads. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> Buy five copies. <laughs> So, um, you want to talk about Grey Gardens? Oh yeah, yeah. So you, so in the book, how many of you have seen the movie Grey Gardens? Like everybody, right? Everybody. Right. Well, not everybody. <laughs> I notice no hands in the Callahan row. <laughs> <laughs> Went up for Grey Gardens. You guys did not. You've never seen Grey Gardens? Oh, who's seen it over there? Anita. Anita yeah. So thank you, Anita. <laughs> she is related to me by 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 marriage, though. My blood relatives have not seen one of my favorite movies. There's a documentary so that you guys know about a mother and a daughter who are a, an elderly mother and a, and a middle-aged daughter who lived in a mansion in East Hampton, New York. They had been abandoned by the men in their lives and the mansion had gone basically to seed. It became vine encrusted and raccoon infested. And they lived there together as these eccentric, uh, weird local legends. Uh, They were uh, cousins of Jacqueline uh, Bouvier Kennedy Onassis. So they had family money that kind of kept things going along. But in, as they were isolated in this house, they, 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 they went weird and started telling each other stories about how, how, what victims they were of life. And arguably, they were. And then two uh, documentary filmmakers, brothers, David and Albert Mazels, of Brookline, Massachusetts, by the way, uh, went and just filmed them. Um, and it's an amazing, st- amazing sympathetic portrait of two, uh, two really interesting and sad characters. And it all turns um, because the, the daughter, the middle-aged daughter of this dysfunctional mother-daughter couple, uh, who, uh, who always dreamed of being in showbiz, sees this documentary as her big break. And she starts performing for the Maisels in ways that are uh, a little uncomfortable. And it ended up being her big break. <laughs> it's, it's just an amazing, it's an amazing movie. And it was my favorite movie. And, uh, and uh, that's what I, that's the setup. So... And how did you end up in that house drinking a martini out of a glass with little Edie's initials monogrammed on it? Well, I just lead an incredible life. <laughs> I brag in the book about, about <laughs> the weird circumstance by which having this being my favorite movie for the longest time, my neighbor said, oh yeah, my brother, my brother rents that house. Uh, we can go there. And I'm like, no, he said, my brother rents that house. And I said... Normally, I would slow play this and sort of work it for a couple of months, mentioning it, wheedling an invitation, but I don't have time for that. <laughs> Call your brother. We're going this weekend. <laughs> the house had been bought by, by Ben Bradley and Sally Quinn, Ben Bradley the, of the Washington Post and his wife, Sally Quinn, um, at, at a time when it was sold to them by Little Edie. Uh, they were both, by the way, the mother and daughter were both named Edie, so there's Big Edie and Little Edie. This is why the Callahans should really love this story. <laughs> so, uh, and uh, Sally Quinn, uh, Little e- Big Edie had died, and Little Edie was selling the house in like around 1980, and, Sal- and everyone had gone to the house, 
and noticed that it was full of uh, poisonous raccoon feces and was falling down and the stench that came out of the house was monstrous and little Edie was like, I don't know why anyone is, isn't, uh, she was very protective of the house and its legacy and little Edie was like, I don't know why anyone, no one is buying this house and Sally Quinn just said, I don't know why either. All it needs is a coat of paint. <laughs> and little Edie was like, I'm selling it to you. <laughs> That's what you do. So anyway, yeah, we got, to, we got to stay there and live in there. If you've seen the movie, you know they share a room, and I got to sleep in that room. Wow. And, uh, and then uh, I found this martini glass, and I just noticed that it was monogrammed EBB, and I had a really, it was a very exciting moment for me. So thank you for talking about Grey Gardens with me, Mary. <laughs> Anything for you, John? Thank you. Now you can go to one of your actual questions. <laughs> no, I did, you know, I did want to know about that. Yeah. All right. So um, you have some other stuff in the book about how when you were young, you were sort of a, you know, you were rigid about following the rules. Yes. You couldn't tolerate ambiguity. Right. You did not like riding the bus because who knows where it could end up. That's right. I like the... <laughs> <laughs> I, like, I like the subway. That's fine. Because that... Thank you. There's one, one young gentleman back there clapping. Uh, you understand what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> Right, because the, the subway, it's limited. That's on tracks. It can only, you get on a bus, that thing could go anywhere. <laughs> the, if, a bus, if a bus driver decides to experiment with hallucinogenic mushrooms that morning. <laughs> As often happens. Yeah, well, you don't know. You don't know. You're, you're, I, won't, you're, I won't say your life is in his or her hands because nothing's going to push over a bus. The bus is going to survive any crash. But definitely you're... you're your root and day is in that person's hands. And if that person gets high on shrooms, you could end up anywhere. You could end up like blocks from your actual destination, which <laughs> intolerable. <laughs> intolerable ambiguity for me. And the subway, that's on tracks. There's a limit to, you know, if you're if the subway conductor or the subway engineer takes shrooms, you're going to die, but you're going to die on the way to a place that you're, place that you know <laughs> but I, I was uh, un, un, unlike my mom who had five siblings and my dad who had two siblings uh, I was in and continued to be an only child uh, uh, my mom was raised Catholic in Philadelphia uh, with uh, initially with one sibling and then all of a sudden five more uh, and uh, Catholics right you got it and uh, and in a small house in, in Northeast Philadelphia. And then uh, when she went to college and met my dad and got her degree in nursing and, and they had some money, she took a, a complete 180. She immediately became an atheist, bought a 22 room house and had one child. <laughs> it was completely went the other way. And uh, it was this dilapidated house in Brookline at a time when there was a middle class in Brookline, and uh, even though it was a huge house, it had fallen apart. It would have been a commune for a long time, and my mom fixed it up herself. But even so, you know, we rented out whole wings of the house to students and and boarders and tenants and stuff like that. So, and I and there I was, you know, when you live when you're an only child in a family where you know your mom and dad are married and they love one another. It's a very odd relationship because you come to rely on each other for company as much as anything else. And they're not really your parents so much as your weird older roommates. <laughs> and you can, especially if you're wandering around a 20-room house. You kind of see each other twice a week or whatever. It's like, <laughs> did you pay that gas bill? <laughs> and, I, and But also, as an only child, I had had no, chil no siblings to, to push back at me or to beat me up or to you know, uh, say that I, my Doctor Who scarf looked dumb or anything. So even though I am a creature of pure fear, I had a weird and an irrational sense of uh, confidence in myself because there was no one to say, yeah, you shouldn't, you shouldn't grow your hair long and then wear a fedora. That's a bad, <laughs> it's a bad look. And because I uh, was always in, indifferent to sports and didn't play any of them, uh, I had no, none of the rehearsal of conflict that sports affords where you learn that it's okay to get into a fake fight with a person and still be friends at the end. That's what sports is, fake fighting. You understand that, right? <laughs> or you can get into a real fight with someone and be friends with them at the end. 
So all conflict to me was entirely uh, unacceptable. Uh, whether it was a confrontation of a fight or a confrontation of hugging and kissing someone, anything just felt <laughs> fatal to me. And so I just, I wrapped myself in my Doctor Who scarf and as adolescence approached, I was like, Dude, I do not want. I, 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 and, that's, and so I took on all these loathsome affectations in order to become the sexless gentleman bachelor of age 39 that I wanted to be. And I didn't want to break the rules. I wanted to know what the rules were so that I could follow them perfectly so that I would be approved of and loved by every human on earth because I didn't know what would happen if I was not approved of and loved by every human on earth. It was not, I, growing up people would say well, being an only child must have been terrible. And I was like, uh, I'm sorry that you're insane. <laughs> it's the greatest, you don't have to share anything. I'm sorry that you had the trauma of having a sibling and having to share your parents' love. Don't put that on me. I had a great, I had a great time. I had my own room and then when I turned 13, I had my own apartment. <laughs> One of, the, one of the boarders left the house. They had a little apartment in, in, at one end of the house, and I told my mom and dad, uh, that's mine now. I, uh, I need more space. I'm 13. I've earned it. <laughs> and they, and they, just, they didn't say no, maybe because they didn't hear me at the other end of the dining room. <laughs> I created a whole weird, isolated life for myself. What was the question? Well, I, I was... Uh, Leading from the, you know, did not like ambiguity. Yes, did not deal with right. ambiguity and did not, you know, wanted to follow rules and you had, the, in your youth. Yes. And then you get not to this. Not just in my youth. Well, you get to this chapter. Yes. About the. Oh, in this book? In, in Vacation this, Land? In this book you wrote. Yeah. I don't have the cover, but right. sorry. Um, and the chapter about the pitchforks. Daddy Pitchfork. Oh, Daddy Pitchfork and Pitchfork Jr.? Where you go, so in the, over the course of the book, you go from not tolerating ambiguity and wanting to follow, follow all the rules to getting super drunk with strangers in a well, small wait a southern minute. town. Wait, wait a minute. Come on. <laughs> wait, a, my family's here. Don't. No, I'm sorry. Just a little bit. A little bit I drunk. just had. Just I had. I had one drink. <laughs> no, I start. So yeah, I st I started uh, loosening up. Uh, uh, when I turned 40. <laughs> and I, I, started, uh, I started loosening up a little bit and wanting, and wanting to embrace ambiguity a little bit more. That's when I started experimenting with marijuana when I turned 40. Your family's here. And not be, yeah, and experimenting. <laughs> it's, the experiment turned out to be not for me. But, <laughs> and the only reason I did was I, I, I had never had any problem with drugs I, I have been sucking on an asthma inhaler since I was in uh, yay high, um, but uh, I didn't like breaking the law, and marijuana was illegal, and also it was gross. It was this gross weed that was like witchcraft and pulled out of the earth and delivered to your dorm room by a bad-smelling white guy with dreadlocks. I didn't want to have anything. It seemed very unseemly to me. And, but by the time I turned 40, it was being not only decriminalized in a lot of states and commonwealths, but also it being put into new forms. You no longer, you no longer s smoked it out of a weird brazier or whatever, like a druid. <laughs> like they, were, they, were, they, were putting, they were putting it into edible pills and breath strips and, uh, and, uh, and vapor, and these vaporizers looked like these beautiful consumer electronic products. It was all very civilized. And I'm like, well, if you're gonna put marijuana into an inhaler, who am I to say no? <laughs> So, the story you're referring to is when I was invited to a college to, uh, uh, to, to present their annual uh, Mark Twain lecture. Uh, and, uh, and I was invited to go on a, a specific date, that date being 420. Yeah, I know what that means. That's how, and I was like, I think those college kids are gonna give me a lot of marijuana. And it's gonna be great, because they're gonna love this 46-year-old dad. I wasn't 46 at the time. Uh, and the story is about how I go to the college and no one wants to have anything to do with me. Except for this one, these, this father and son, uh, who, the college was not exactly in the south. It was in the very north of the American south. And, but I had been through the south and I'd seen this father-son combination before. Uh, this sort of affluent, white, 
father and son of the American South, and you can who uh, dress exactly alike. Dads and sons, like there's some nods there, right? Dads and sons, affluent white dads and sons, both dress like their dads. They both wear blazers and uh, and button-down shirts and uh, pants that are better than Dockers, but they still look like Dockers. <laughs> and this 50-year-old man and his 21-year-old son come came ambling up to the professor who had invited me there, and they were like, "Hey, uh, you know, we're we're we're, we're going to have a party with you later on." I'm like, well, I guess I'm your prisoner, so okay, we'll do that. <laughs> and the dad, and I was looking at these these two guys, both dressed as dads, and the <laughs> and the dad says, uh, I brought a, I brought a bottle of whiskey uh, that's pretty good, and we can bring it over to the guest uh, the guest house where you're staying, and drink it. And I'm like, okay, if you say so. And then the son goes, and I have some marijuana and maybe we can smoke some of it later. And I, he said, in front of his dad. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and then the dad said, 420, right, son? <laughs> and the son said, you know it, daddy. And I was like, I have severely misjudged what is going on here. My understanding of the American South is all wrong. Because these guys both dressed like dads, but they were both acting like teenagers the entire time. And they were, all they wanted to talk about was indie rock bands. And, you know, I've been spending time on the internet after I turned 40 just researching cool music so I can remain relevant and cool. But these guys were talking about all these bands like Mark with a C and Nescafe Moments and Koosh Ball and No Monster Club and Loath. And I had never heard of any of these bands. And I made up all but one of them. And... <laughs> And that's, why, and that's why in the book I refer to them as Daddy Pitchfork and Pitchfork Jr. Because they're just so cool. And I was humiliated by both of them. And I didn't end up smoking or eating marijuana that night, but I did black out because I had a lot of bourbon. And when I woke up in the morning, uh, I, had a, I had an existential experience that you can read about in the book. I thought that maybe my whole life had been imagined and that I was starting a new life. And then I realized that uh, my, my whole life was the same and it had happened and I knew it because not only was I wearing the same clothes that I had fallen asleep in, um, but in my pocket there was a CD, a CD-ROM, remember those? It was a mixtape on a CD-ROM and on, on it there was a note that sa it said, this is... Uh, it was a it was a mixtape of some Frank Ocean songs, and it was uh, a note that said, "John, we hope you enjoy this." Signed, Pitchfork and Pitchfork Junior. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, there's only one reason they would have written that note, because they couldn't say it to me. Obviously, they slipped it into my jacket while I was asleep. <laughs> so they're creeps, is what I'm talking about. <laughs> What was your question? You know, you were, at that point, you became comfortable with some ambiguity and not following rules. Oh, no. <laughs> I, I tell that story, excuse me, I have to sneeze. This has been happening to me lately. After I turned 46, I have to sneeze, but I know I'm never going to sneeze. <laughs> and that lasts for about 35 minutes. <laughs> no, I tell that story as a warning to my children. Oh, good. Yeah. Don't do Don't, this. Yeah. Yeah. Don't. By by the way, don't uh, don't get really drunk with people you don't know at a college. <laughs> that's that's my warning because you might end up with a Frank Ocean mixtape in your pocket. <laughs> you can you can, if you if you if you have an experience with marijuana, the the first experience you have, if it's like I had, which was being invited uh, by. Uh, a gay couple who worked with you at the art movie theater in, in Brookline uh, to lunch because one of the couple was dying of AIDS and they were arranging lunches to say goodbye to their colleagues. And you are 19 years old and invited to this horrible and yet moving gesture and you have a wonderful lunch uh, and, and, uh, and that's sad and, and joyous at the same time. And then 
the, the one of the couple says to you, would you like to smoke some marijuana? The, the polite thing to do is say yes, especially since I was told that they had the same connection as the Kennedy family. And I like the finer things in life, so I wasn't <laughs> going to say no. And uh, as I say in the book to my children, if that's your experience, that's an acceptable experience in which to have marijuana. But if you're at a party and a drummer offers it to you, no, don't. <laughs> Good, good rule of thumb. Yeah. I like that chapter because you, uh, you say that the, the man who invited you there, um, Kenny, was wearing an eye patch and he looked amazing. Yeah. And you know, I have an, you eye, have an, eye, patch I have an eye patch in my life. Yeah, that's right. Patrick, stand up and let everyone see your eye patch. <laughs> no, no, he, he won't. No, no, okay, no, 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 no. <laughs> well, he does look amazing. You'll see him later. I think he might be the only one with an eye patch here, so you'll know that's Patrick, Mary's husband. So, um, so. So in preparing for this evening, I yeah. was very diligent. You did too I, much. I, I did a lot. Um, I also listened. You knew I was just going to talk up here the whole time. I apologize. But I, but I have to give you, you know, stuff to riff yeah. off of. You had to prime the pump. That's a saying I made up. <laughs> <laughs> I got a lot of good ones. <laughs> I, I mentioned this last night when I was in Portland, Maine, and they did not like this joke. And maybe you guys will feel differently. The first time I ever heard the term dad joke, this isn't the joke, but the first time I ever heard the term dad joke was in Park Slope, Brooklyn, where I live. And as I say in the book, it's easy when you live in New York to pretend that you are still a child because you never have to learn to drive. You know, you, even if you grow up enough that you, in the, to have the impossible thing happen, that you can afford your own home in New York, you're still going to buy a condo or you know, a, 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 an apartment of some kind, which is just a glorified dorm room. You never have to clear a gutter. You never have to fix a, a plumbing. That's a thing, right? <laughs> fix a plumbing. <laughs> Something goes wrong, you just, you just call a, 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 a management company or a landlord or a super or some other surrogate dad to fix it for you while you just wander off to go drinking again or whatever it is you do. And of course, all the young people in, in Brooklyn, you know, all the dudes are growing terrible beards just like me. And they're all dressing like old people just like I did when I was 13 or whatever. And so it's very easy to forget that there is a generational gap, excuse me, that there's a generational gap between you and these young people who might be like, say, working at the coffee shop and so I went into the coffee shop, uh, and the young uh, uh, female barista was there, and she was wearing overalls. And I made note of this, because I'm a very keen observer, and, and <laughs> I work everything into a narrative. And I said to her, you know, uh, I think you deserve uh, a, a, an award in the category of overall excellence. <laughs> oh. mm. and, she, and she looked at me. For a long time, she said, nice dad joke. <laughs> a term I had never heard before then. And that's how I died. <laughs> I'm, a go I'm, a, I'm a spooky ghost now. <laughs> but then I, was at, I, had, I had the opportunity recently to take a, a cooking class with my hero, Jacques Pepin, uh, and not just a cooking class, but an omelet making class. And the only thing I ever want to do every, every t day I wake up is go and make eggs. It's the greatest thing. You just start with the most disgusting chaos and make slightly less disgusting order out of it. <laughs> and I, he showed us how to make an omelet. And, uh, and, uh, and, I, and he was like, does anyone have any questions? And I was going to ask this question, but then I stopped myself because I was like, this is a dad joke. And I, and I have to learn my lesson. And I'd gone back and forth on whether or not it was the right thing to do, to not tell this joke or, or, or make this joke. And so he makes the omelets and he says, does anyone have any questions? And I said, uh, yeah, quick question. Do you have to break eggs to make it or no? <laughs> because of the saying, you have to break eggs, to make an omelet, you have to break eggs, is a saying that I just made up. Uh, maybe that's why. <laughs> I think that's why you guys didn't find it as funny as I did, because no one had ever heard that saying before. I made it up in my mind. This room holds 400 people. It's really exciting that you all are here. All I care about is what do those two people think. 
<laughs> so uh, two out of 400. Also, there are some empty seats here. I want to know where those people are. <laughs> In the front row, no less. Does anyone want to move to the, I see a hand up there. We're going to get to you for a second. But does anyone want to move to, we'd have to split you up. Anyone want to move to the front row? Yeah, all right, come on down. Yay! Do, 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 this is my good friend, Noel. Do, 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 do. Thank you. What's your name? Noel. Noel, thanks for playing. We have another one. Oh, John, John. What? Noel ran the two and five, helped run the two and five festival for several years. Oh, round of applause for Noel. Thank you. Oh, nice to see you again. We have one more empty seat up here if someone wants to take it, but we have a quite do we actually have a question over there? Hi. Um do you uh, keep in contact with Bruce Campbell, and can you mention anything humorous that you uh, encountered with him? Do I keep in contact with Bruce Campbell, and will I mention anything humorous? <laughs> in reference to him and you. In re- no, no I, I understand. <laughs> <laughs> I know that you're tired of hearing about me. I will tell you about Bruce Campbell. And me. Oh, me and Bruce. Uh, Bruce Campbell, if you don't know... Uh, who doesn't know who Bruce Campbell is? What? Wow. Who said, what? <laughs> yeah. Now you understand. Get out of your bubble. <laughs> this is real America. <laughs> I learned the hard way. Because in 1990, middle of the 1990s, when I was working at the literary agency where I worked, uh, we just, we got fast internet. I think we got a T1 line or whatever. And the, and the World Wide Web. We upgraded from DOS to the World Wide Web, like that, boom. And of course, the first thing I did was, uh, I didn't Google, because it didn't exist, I Alta vista my own name, <laughs> nothing. Then I started looking for things that I might have in common with other weirdos out there, uh, cultural things, touchstones that were meaningful in my life, and one of the names I put in was Bruce Campbell. Bruce Campbell, uh, is the star of a series of cult horror movies, The Evil Dead, The Evil Dead 2, and Army of Darkness, uh, which has now been revived as a, a new TV series. And he's a, an, a working actor with a, a, a cult following as, of his own because he's very handsome, cl- sort of classically lantern-jawed, matinee idol handsome, but a real goofball uh, that everyone loves. And uh, he had this weird career for a long time uh, being, if you went to a horror movie convention, in the in the convention hall, he was a god, and in the lobby, he was a schlub that no one paid attention to. And I thought, and one of the, I put in Bruce Campbell into the internet, and all of these results came back, because the internet was, back then, the province of just weird white dudes with computers like me, who knew about this stuff. And people were talking about Bruce Campbell, and one of the people talking about Bruce Campbell was Bruce Campbell. He had his own website, and he was writing about being a B-movie actor, and I contacted him, and I said, I've, uh, would you ever consider writing a book? And we ended up, he, in classic Bruce Campbell fashion, he sabotaged his own livelihood uh, to give a young guy a break, and I represented his book, and it sold, and it was called Conf- uh, If Chins Could Kill, because he's got a very big chin. <laughs> Terrible title, but he... He chose it, Confessions of a, of a B-Movie Actor. And the sequel just came out, which is called what, sir? Revenge of the Chin. Revenge of the Chin. <laughs> and, uh, and Bruce asked me to write the introduction to that book. And so we do keep in touch. The, what's that? I think he's like you, very humorous. He is, he is very, he's a very funny guy. The book is great. Uh, also for sale at bookstores everywhere. <laughs> Uh, and Bruce, you know, Bruce is a, a, a wonderful guy who really, you know, con- when I, uh, <laughs> when I, uh, he consistently would give people chances and was loyal to people that he had uh, been working with for a long time. And uh, I was grilled by his manager at the time as to why I should represent his book. And I had to buy a suit jacket for the first time to have that meeting. Uh, it didn't, and I was terrified. And the manager was just telling the story about how Bruce, you know, Bruce has been offered a major role in this huge HBO miniseries from the Earth to the Moon. And unfortunately, he turned it down because he promised his childhood friend Sam Raimi that he would be in three more episodes of Hercules' Legendary Journeys. (laughs) 
That's a guy who made some bad choices for his career, <laughs> but some great choices about what he values in life. And honoring, honoring his, his promise to his childhood friend, I think ultimately did him very well. And, uh, but we've had no funny stories together. That's the end of that. <laughs> Hi, Andy. Hi. Weird dad. Brought two kids to prove it. <laughs> oh. They How old are your kids? Uh, 11 and 14. 11 and 14. And Pot can, can they stand podcast. up, please? Oh, sure. Oh, no. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, hey, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, children. <laughs> yes. Is this really your father? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we yeah, live next to a cemetery, by the way. Do you need uh, help? <laughs> but that is a sweet vest that you're wearing, young man. Well done. And... Uh, 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 young woman. I don't know why I'm using genders. Those are passe. But I'm, I'm an older person, so forgive me if you identify differently. <laughs> I'm sincere in that. You're wearing some kind of t-shirt. Are you, are you representing anything with your t-shirt? Is there, or is it just a design? I can't Doctor, see from it, here. It's Doctor Who. Oh, nice. oh. My weird attempt at trying to fit in. <laughs> well done. No, please. <laughs> First of all, uh, props to you both for sitting down very slowly in a creepy way. <laughs> if, you, if you didn't watch it, I could see they were like this. In, in tandem, they just went. <laughs> okay. I, which doctor? I want to know which doctor. Yeah, I want to know which doctor, too. The 11th. Oh. That's David Tennant. Yeah. Ugh. Oh, come on. <laughs> Be real. David Tennant's amazing. <laughs> He's very, he's very, he was an adorable doctor. Yes. We had a question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so we, really, we, we, no. I think I know we, who has a question. We do listen to the podcast together. I'm much more interested in your children than you. <laughs> uh, I, uh, they didn't that talk. sounds wrong, but they you didn't know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> Mustache man. Um, all right, so the question, we listen to the podcast a lot. We love your settled law, especially on siblings. What um, was that? that having a boy and a girl living together in a house is like having, living with another old married couple on the verge of divorce. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes, sir. Yes. No. Um, that on the verge of divorce is your edition. It may be, yeah. It's like living with an old married couple that love each other but get on each other's nerves. Well, they're 11 and 14. Uh, the other side of law, of course, being people are allowed to like what they like. Uh, we use that in our house. But the third, I'd love if you would expound, expound for just a minute or two, on nostalgia is always a toxic impulse. That's nostalgia created a lot of the most toxic impulse. Most most toxic impulse. We discuss that a lot. I'd love to hear you say a little more about it. Well, apparently I'm your prisoner, so I. Would... <laughs> <laughs> Normally, when I am asked to dance, someone throws pennies on the stage. <laughs> the gentle the gentleman refers to. My podcast, the Judge John Hodgman podcast, a very popular podcast. Um, I do not look f backward fondly upon the past because the past is over and nostalgia is the most toxic impulse. Nostalgia is fun, right? It's very comforting. I have no problem with you watching a movie that you liked from your childhood. I have no problem with you enjoying... Uh, your Star Wars figures, or your baseball cards from the past. I, have, I like old things. That's great. But real nostalgia is fueled on twin uh, logical fallacies, twin delusions. One, that the past was better than today, which is not true for almost everyone. Uh, and that B, we can get back to the past, which is equally untrue because of science. <laughs> and the idea that, there, that the past was better and that we can get back to that illusory better past is, to my mind, the, f the fundamental principle behind every extremist uh, movement in the world right now, uh, on, all, on all sides of the political spectrum. Um, and uh, at the risk of being political, you can have conservative views, you can have uh, different 
social views than I have, and, uh, and I will always respect your right to have them. You are my neighbor in, uh, in, in this nation uh, and a fellow citizen. But the idea that uh, we can make America great again is offensive to me because uh, America has never been exactly great. Greatness is something we uh, aspire to. And that means moving forward, not trying to go back to an imagined past or a past that was good for some people but terrible for others. So that's why I say that. But, but that does not mean that, that, does not, that does not mean that n nostalgia as, an ex as a, a, a toxic impulse is, is exclusive only to uh, the, the right wing. I mean, it's true of the left wing. It's true of um, uh, all religious extremist movements. It's just, it's bad, it's bad news when you allow that to guide a, a, a movement and a worldview because we, we do move in one direction. Here, right I now. don't know if it's a good idea to follow that with what I was about to ask, which was, um, I know that Pete's diner is closed. Uh, Little Pete's is closed. Have you found a new yeah. diner? I, Little Pete's is my, was my favorite diner in Center City. Uh, and it closed, uh, and it is sad that it closed, um, because the past was better. <laughs> and what it's what it's being replaced with is garbage. <laughs> little Pete's was a little Pete's was a you know, but that's cities change and they evolve. And obviously, Center City, Philadelphia is very different in a lot of ways from when I would visit it. You know, as a kid visiting my family here, and then as a young adult visiting. My wife, who attended Bryn Mawr College, we would meet here, and um, yeah, it's a. If you don't know Bryn Mawr, it's a, it's a small school of witchcraft and wizardry. <laughs> a joke I first told on this stage works every time. Uh, I'm sad that it closed, and uh, and I'm sad that it's being replaced by whatever it's being replaced with. But I will find another diner. There is always more scrapple. Mm -hmm. I am an only child. And uh, this man... I think someone who, over there is going like this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm with you. This man who I've chosen to spend my life with is an only child. And oh, boy, oh, boy. are hoping to adopt a future only child. Mm -hmm. Are we making a terrible mistake? You're looking to adopt a future only child? We're getting older. It's not like we're going to just well, have I do, I don't. I'm not asking you to justify the choices that you make in life. <laughs> I think, I think adoption are. is a, 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 a wonderfully noble thing to do, even if you can have children. Is so it wrong? I don't need to <laughs> know about your fertility status, but thank you. No, it's a choice. It's a choice. You are, well, it may be that the child you adopt is not an only child, you know, but in well, any case, uh, you are thoughts. thinking about adopting a child and adopting no more than one child. Correct. Is that a mistake? No. Yep. Why, why would that be a mistake? I don't know, because we live in a small row house. Yeah, no, but perfect. Three, three weirdos together. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're making you assumptions about my You guys are going to have the time weirdos. of your lives. <laughs> no. I had the time of my life with my parents. I mean, it's truly our ages converged at about 38. <laughs> they were a little older, I was a little younger, but we were all just watching Brideshead Revisited together. <laughs> oh, okay, I can look forward yeah. to that feature. I, I, would say, I would say your child will not, and this is really hard for me to say, your child will not want to play sports. Uh, I mean, he plays ultimate frisbee. Are you saying that's not a sport? Kind, kind I don't of. feel I need to say that. <laughs> you Your him? child will, as I did, will resist situations in which they are uncomfortable because there is conflict and challenge. Yeah. And you need to encourage them to, to go out and face those situations so that they don't end up like I did and I would dare say you and Ultimate Frisbee, your husband, did. <laughs> so that they don't fear conflict. But other than that, you're going to have the time of your lives. Okay, thanks. Yeah, just think about how much extra money you're going to have. <laughs> I mean, also, by the way, maybe no children. How about that? <laughs> then you just have a great time for the rest of your life. <laughs> Uh, you, you talk fondly of Philadelphia. Um, yes. Don't you think Amazon should move here? No. no. Oh. <laughs> Divided sentiments. Well, first of all, thank you, sir, for imagining that I have some say in it. <laughs> <laughs> Let me make a quick phone call. <laughs> Hello, Jeff? <laughs> yes, it's me. Let's do Philadelphia. 
All right, you're all going to have to move because... <laughs> that's, yeah. Uh, that's an interest, it's an interesting thing, isn't it, to have major... I mean, obviously, major cities have been, you know, groveling before the International Olympic Committee to get sports games uh, with the imagined idea that it's going to somehow benefit their city and it almost always ruins their economy. Mm -hmm. um, but the idea of the major cities groveling before a corporation as though it is bigger than, and it is, it's bigger than a city. I mean, it's more, it's more influential than a, than a city is now, you know. I don't know. I guess Amazon coming to a place would be good, right? What, why do you want Amazon here? You wouldn't ask the question if you didn't. Why do you, why? Give them the microphone. I don't know why I'm talking. <laughs> I th I think it would I think it would bring a lot of uh, prestige to the city and improve the prestige. Economy. This is goddamn Philadelphia. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Philadelphia doesn't need any stinking prestige. Are you are you not a Philadelphian? <laughs> it's it's awesome without prestige. That's the whole point. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, if it would actually provide economic boon, sure. I think Philadelphia would be a great place for Amazon to have its headquarters. Um, get get ready for a lot of insufferable people. Yeah. Oh, wait a minute. This is being we live streamed. Never mind. I love you, Jeff. I love Amazon. I'm in pro I'm a Prime member. Give 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 Philadelphia a shot. It would be interesting. Well, I'm not going to go down that road. Uh, can you explain how you became a literary agent? I can explain how I became a literary agent. I graduated from college. I went to Yale University, which is an accredited four-year institution in, <laughs> in southern Connecticut uh, with, a, with a, a very desirable degree in literary theory, which is uh, <laughs> it's not the same thing as an English major. I didn't study books so much as the idea of books. <laughs> And now. <laughs> and when I arrived in New York under orders from my then girlfriend, now wife, uh, to, to live, I found it surprising that there was not uh, a, a fund set aside for me <laughs> to support myself, maybe living in a, in a, in a Dr. Strange-like uh, townhouse in Greenwich Village to just think all of my deep thoughts. I needed to get a job. At that time, you would look in the back of newspapers for, advertise, for jobs that were being advertised. And there was a job available as a receptionist at this literary agency. I liked, I was a writer at the time. Uh, I liked the world of book publishing. Um, it seemed uh, pleasantly indolent. And so I went for an interview at this, uh, at this a uh, literary agency, which was in an old townhouse. Uh, it had been the private bank of the Astor family, so it had a cool old vault in the back. Dark wood paneling, a lot of ferns and brass, and it looked like the idea of what a publishing concern should look like, and I saw a lot of dark corners where I knew I could probably take a nap. <laughs> and they offered me the job answering phones, and I took it, and it was just that simple. It's a, it, was a, it was a riches to rag story. The guy, the guy who came from some means didn't actually owe a lot, of, a lot of student debt. And all of a sudden, there he was in New York City answering telephones and making $17,000 a year. Uh, and, then I, and then I did other things. That's how it, I just applied for a job and I got it. <laughs> Uh, John, I just wanted to know what it feels like to have abandoned the beautiful city of Greenfield, Massachusetts, and also what it's like to have put that down in writing. Well, first of all, I don't like your tone of familiarity, sir. <laughs> and where you're coming out of the box just going, hey, John, what's your name? Uh, my name is Jim Crucis. I'm from Greenfield, Massachusetts. <laughs> Originally. I live here now. But. What is your last name? Uh, Crucis. Crucis? Yeah. Well, Mr. Crucis. 
I will show respect for you by <laughs> acknowledging that you are a stranger to me. Uh, I, the, the gentleman from Greenfield raises the point that uh, when my mom passed away, uh, the weekend home that my mom and dad had in western Massachusetts near the town of Greenfield uh, was no longer emotionally tolerable to my dad, and so it came, it was essentially bequeathed to me and my wife to pay for and take care of, and long before we had our time in Maine, we did a lot of our, our growing up as young parents in this house in western Massachusetts in a town that I will not name for fear of you. Uh, <laughs> Not far from the town of Greenfield, Massachusetts, um, w which we, we still have the house, and it's very happily my dad, who's now remarried to a very nice person, has actually been using the house, and that's the way it should be. And, and so we'll probably hang on to it as a family, but we now spend more time in Maine, and, and Mr. Cruces was lamenting the fact that I had abandoned Greenfield and <laughs> maybe was making reference to the f fact that in my my special on Netflix, I referred to Greenfield as a shithole. <laughs> which was an unfair thing to say, uh, because Greenfield had, had, like many cities in, in western Massachusetts and, and throughout uh, sort of semi-rural America, had been built on manufacturing. In the case of uh, western Massachusetts, there were a lot of foundries, there were a lot of paper mills, there were a lot of uh, furniture mills, there are other, other different kinds of factories that all disappeared, right? And that's, that's why we have, no, we have so little manufacturing in the United States, because it all went elsewhere and time moved forward and people got hurt. Um, and consequently, uh, uh, Greenfield took a lot of state money to, um, uh, in exchange for having a, a small penitentiary and a bunch of treatment centers for people with addiction and a bunch of halfway houses. Uh, and at the same time, the Northeast started descending into uh, what you, we know now as the, uh, the opioid epidemic. So Greenfield, which was a nice American town, got a little shady for a while because there were people, very desperate people, uh, living there. And it was also, for a brief time, a, a stopover place for the transport of drugs between New York City and, um, uh, and uh, uh, Canada. Uh, so uh, it was an unfair thing for me to call Greenfield a shithole. I've apologized to the people of Greenfield. Uh, and um, when I did apologize uh, in my, on my website, I went up there uh, with my family and went to the Big Y supermarket. And uh, I was a little nervous that I was going to get accosted uh, for saying the initial thing. And uh, at one point I was sitting there uh, getting ready to drive out with my groceries and someone, you know, on my window of my car. I'm like, what is this? She said, roll down your window. I'm like, what? She said, I heard what you said about Greenfield. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but I think Greenfield's doing a little bit better. Uh, it's got, first of all, it's got uh, the Amtrak goes there now. The John Olver uh, uh, Transportation Center is there. You can take a train from New York to Greenfield. Uh, and it's got great restaurants, Hope and Olive and Magpie, uh, and it is, the gate, it is the gateway to the Mohawk Trail. So, uh, Mr. Cruces, I salute you and your town. Uh, thank you for traveling all this way to seek vengeance. <laughs> but in fact, we are friends. It's time. So, we're gonna, we're gonna go, I'm gonna do one quick thing with your indulgence, because this is actually the perfect introduction to it. Uh, uh, and, um, and then we're gonna go up to the lobby. Uh, you are all forced to buy books. Uh, I believe that those books have been signed already by me, some of them, all right? Well, whether they are signed or not, if you'd like to come see me, I will re-sign them, personalize them, do whatever. If you're one of the very nice people in the world who um, pre-ordered a book, uh, and then wanted to come to this event and learned you had to buy another copy of the book, and you're like, I don't want two of these dumb things. Uh, and you made that sacrifice. I have a piece of special merchandise for you, a patch designed by Aaron Draplin who designed the book cover. Uh, so just be honest. If you bought two copies of the book when you only needed one, let me know. 
We'll have a conversation about it. I'll give you something. But if you aren't that, I will still have a lovely conversation with you and we'll sign things and we'll have a good time. And if you're not interested in sticking around, just do me the decency of explaining why. I mean, just... <laughs> But before we go, ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause for Mary Richardson Graham. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sing one short song. And Mary, I'm, you may leave the stage, but I need your help because this is for the live stream also. This is probably, I don't think I have clearance to perform this on the internet, but we're going to do it anyway because you all heard about how I'm a rebel now and I don't care about the rules. So I'm going to need one mic for my ukulele and one mic for me. We're going to use these two mics to do it. Does that work more or less? Yeah? If you have questions that didn't get answered, come and see me at the signing table. I'm not sure this is in tune, but I'm going to play it anyway because it's rock and roll. I am from Massachusetts, and um, I love it. I love Philadelphia, I love all the places I go, but I am from Massachusetts and I don't get to spend as much time there as I used to. Hang on. This is a song about Massachusetts that was written, uh, not surprisingly, if you know this band at all. Oops, let me do this. That's better. There we go. By Jonathan Richmond and the Modern Lovers. Uh, Marty Walsh, who is currently cruising to re-election as the mayor of Boston, uh, when he was a state legislator, introduced a bill that would have named this song the official rock song of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And uh, that was going really well because it's a great song. Uh, it also has a, a Massachusetts in many of the lyrics, it's including the lyric, I'm in love with Massachusetts. How could you have another rock song? more perfect to be the state rock song of Massachusetts. And I was about to clear and, and pass that legislation when uh, something very Massachusettsian happened. Some other people in Massachusetts uh, learned that someone else wanted something. <laughs> and that could not be allowed to stand. <laughs> Massachusetts, of course, being the birthplace of spite. <laughs> people who had no interest in the state rock song whatsoever decided, no, it's got to be something else, and they introduced, other legislator, legislators introduced a bill uh, that would uh, name another song uh, as the state rock song, uh, and consequently, uh, both bills were defeated, and there is no official rock song of the state of Massachusetts. <laughs> the other song that they wanted to be uh, the official rock song of Massachusetts uh, was a song called Dream On by Aerosmith. And that is definitely a song. <laughs> but it is not a rock song. It is a power ballad. <laughs> this is a rock song. Road runner, road runner. Going faster miles an hour. Gonna drive to the stop and shop. That's a thing we have. With my radio on. I'm in love with Massachusetts And the neon when it's cold outside And the highway when it's late at night I got my radio on I'm the roadrunner I'm in love with modern moonlight Route 128 when it's dark outside I'm in love with Massachusetts I'm in love with the radio on Helps me not be so lonely late at night Helps me not feel so alone late at night Don't feel so bad now I'm in the car Don't feel so alone I got my radio on I'm the roadrunner That's right Welcome to the spirit of 1956 Nostalgia Patient in the bushes next to 57. The highway's your girlfriend as you go by quick. Suburban trees, suburban speed, and it smells like heaven. I said, Roadrunner once, Roadrunner twice. I'm in love with rock and roll. Obviously. <laughs> and I'll be out all night. Bob and Barbers, y'all. Oh, 
run around, run around, going faster miles an hour. Now I drive right to the stop and shop. When I drive with my radio on, and me in love with modern moonlight, me in love with modern rock and roll, modern girls and modern rock and roll. I'm gonna drive with my radio on, I'm the roadrunner. Now you sing, modern lovers. Radio on! Radio! Alright, so that's your part. That's where you're supposed to be. Where you're supposed to be singing. I understand some people don't feel like singing along. It's embarrassing. Don't think you have a good voice. Guess what? You don't. It's not the point. Singing along is fun. You feel better when you sing along. You don't sing along, you go home alone at night and go, oh, I wish I had sung along. <laughs> it seemed like fun. In fact, you don't even have to sing along. This is not even a singing song. Just shout along. All you have to do is shout, radio on, radio on, radio on, and keep doing that. And then I will do it with you. And then I will sing something else, but you keep doing the other thing. <laughs> That's how songs work. And then it'll be over, and you'll be happy. <laughs> so here we go again. Radio on! No, no. It's not a call and response. It's not a folk song. It's a rock song. If you hear me do it, Wait until you're supposed to do it, and do it then. <laughs> or do it now. Radio on! Better. Radio on! All right, better but louder. Radio on! Good, now louder and better. Radio on! Good. Radio on! Keep it up. Radio on! Radio on! I got the A! I got, the, I got the car from Massachusetts now. I got, the, I got the power of Massachusetts. I got the power of the Pioneer Valley. Also parts of Southern Vermont. I got the power of Greenfield, Massachusetts. Greenfield is not a shithole. It's just an ordinary town with some economic problems. I got the power of the Mohawk Trail. Also called Route 2. Good job, you guys. Thanks for your kind attention. Mary Richardson Graham, the Free Library of Philadelphia. Thank you, guys. Uh, thanks to Joseph Fox Bookshop and to all of you. Thanks to my family and friends. I'll see you in the lobby. Have a great night. Thanks for coming. I appreciate it.